Church that meets you at Malden. We're glad you're out with us tonight. Hope you had a great afternoon. I hope each one of you pick up the bulletin and take it home and go over the things that's in the bulletin so you keep up with the different events and the ones that are sick and shut-ins. Let's remember the shut-ins that's in the bulletin. Let's remember our sick. Uh, it was announced this morning, Paul Luttrell, he has COVID, so he's out sick. Also, Jeannie said Walt was <coughs> homesick. That's the reason he's not here. Let's remember him also. <clears throat> the uh, evening of prayer will be tomorrow evening at 7 o'clock. So that'll be evening of prayer tomorrow at 7 o'clock. Anybody that can come and will be uh, greatly appreciated. And I know you'll have an uplifting time. Into our service tonight, our song leader will be Joel Foster. Our lesson by Dennis Strine, our closing prayer by Joel Maddox, and <clears throat> we'll begin our worship service with opening prayer. Will you please bow with me? Our kind, lovely Heavenly Father, we thank you for this Lord's day that you've given unto us. We thank you for this opportunity that we have that we can come out and be with our brothers and sisters in Christ, sing praises unto thy name, hear a portion of thy word. <clears throat> we was able to take of the communion this morning and give back a portion unto you. And that we're able to come to you in prayer and talk to you as your children. We pray, thank you at this time for your son Jesus, that he came to this earth, he lived and died as a man, hung up on that cross. <clears throat> Set example for each and every one of us, and we'll do his will at the end of time we can have a home with in heaven. Thank you also be with our brother Joel as he leads our singing tonight. He has a very recollection of things that he's <clears throat> is going to sing. And then we'll all lift up our voices of praise unto you and be with Dennis. Also as he <clears throat> prepares the lesson he has that he'll have a very recollection. For each one of us will listen attentively to his lesson. We'll study it when we get home. We'll apply it to our lives so we can be stronger Christians. 
Thank you for Dennis and Vicky as they work here with us, this congregation. Pray that you'll give them many years of service unto you. Also, pray at this time that you'll be with the ones who remember their shut-ins. Pray that you'll be with the ones that take care of them. And pray that you'll comfort them as you know how. Also, be with all of our number that are sick. <clears throat> pray that you'll be with our doctors and nurses and the ones that take care of them that they may return back to their health and can be back out and worship with us. Also, pray at this time that you'll be with all of our leaders for our nation. Pray that they'll look unto you for guidance. Pray that you'll defeat them in things that's not according to thy will. Also, I'll be with all of our military men and women, especially the ones on foreign soils. Pray that you'll keep them safe and return them back to their families. Be with all the ones of our first responders or policemen, all the ones that protect us, and also keep them safe. Also, I pray that you, thank you for the church here, the church the world over. Thank you for the congregation that meets here at Mount, and thank you for all the ones that worship here. Pray that each and everything we say and do here always will be according to thy will. Also pray that you'll be with us, that you'll always guard, guide, direct, that you forgive us for our many sins. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Dale thought that I was an old man grunting when I got up out of the seat over here. Well, he's two weeks older than I am. So. Nine six. Nine six. Mm -hmm. It may be at morn when the day is awaking. When sunlight through sharpness and shadow is breaking, that Jesus will come in the fullness of glory to receive from the earth his own. Oh, Lord Jesus, how long, how long? Caught up through the clouds, 
Come speaks to us. Seven, eight, nine. Seven, eight, nine. <clears throat> Work for the night is coming. Work through the morning. 
morning hours. Work while the dew is sparkling. Work midst springing flowers. Work when the day grows brighter. Work in the glowing sun. Work for the night is coming. When man's work is done. Work for the night is coming. Work through the sunny noon. Fill brightest hours with labor. Rest comes sure and soon. Give every flying minute something to keep in store. sunset skies, while their bright tents are glowing, work for daylight flies, work till the last beam fadeth, fadeth to shine no more, work while the night is darkening, when man's work is over. Turn your Bibles to Mark chapter 13. Mark chapter 13. I just have one other quick announcement. I got in a text this afternoon. A Supreme Court in India is hearing the final arguments on a non-conversion bill. And they will take up that case tomorrow. Please pray that it does not pass the Supreme Court. That will seriously hinder the missionary works that we support in India. As of right now in India, there are only certain states in the country that forbid conversion work. This law bill would make it illegal in all the states of India. So please keep them in your prayers that this bill is defeated in their Supreme Court uh, so that that work will continue. I don't know what it means if it's passed for the work that's already been done. Uh, I guess we'll find out when it and if it happens. There's a lot that is going on in our world today. There are those who try to think, or at least are thinking, that this wars and stuff that we have in Ukraine and the problems that we are facing with North Korea and China are starting to look like the end is near. This has been going on since the third century. There have been 186 predictions since the third century of the end of the world. Some of them, the return of Christ, others by being hit with asteroids. Hysteria always seems to be centered on the end and when it will come and all the various predictions. Many in the religious world today use Mark chapter 13, Matthew 24, and Luke 21 as their basis for coming up with the problem. But we must understand just what Jesus is teaching so that the fear that seems to be gripping the world today will not be our fear. It is important for us not to fear the end, but to grasp it, grab hold of it, be ready for it, and welcome it. The end of all of our problems will come at that moment in time. 
the first two verses of Mark chapter 13, it says, And as he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what a wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, Do you see these great buildings? There will not be left. Here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. These two verses are the foundation of understanding this chapter. Jesus has been in the temple during this time. He has been teaching. It's soon going to be the time for his arrest. And this chapter opens up with Jesus and his disciples leaving the temple complex. They were not going on a sightseeing tour. And this wasn't the first time that Jesus and the disciples came to the temple. Jesus was an obedient Jew. Jesus would have been in Jerusalem three times a year for the festivals and feasts that were required by all Jewish males. So why was this disciple pointing out the magnificence of this temple? You know, if we were to look at the context in the preceding chapters and the ones after, Jesus spent an awful lot of time condemning the religious leaders and declared the fall of the temple in Jerusalem with the cursing of the fig tree the cleansing and the condemnation of the temple, the parable of the tenants. Two days after the condemning of the temple and the leaders, the disciples, remarked about the temple as a point of national pride. We do find a parallel to this in Jeremiah chapter 7. The people in Jeremiah 7 were in disbelief that God would even consider their destruction because they were in possession of the temple. As long as the temple stood, in their minds, God would always be with them. But it was Jesus who said that in spite of the grandeur of the temple, And not a stone will be left on the top of another stone. Here he plainly states what up to now has been implied in all the teachings and parables that he did prior to this. Jesus leaves the temple in verse 3 and goes to the Mount of Olives. This area is opposite the Temple Mount. Jesus was with four of his disciples, Peter, James, John, and Andrew. And they asked him privately, tell us what and when these things will be. What will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? They are looking for that sign. They want to know what to look for. Now, What's important here is they did not ask, when is the end of the world coming? Only about the destruction of the temple. They didn't ask about the second coming of Jesus. Or see, even at this point, they still didn't understand that Jesus was leaving them. Even though, as we've said many times in our lessons in our classes, Jesus has told them over and over and over again. They wanted to know simply when is the destruction of the temple? When is the judgment against the nation going to happen? In those next verses, 5 through 13, Jesus begins describing those events that are going to occur. In verse 8, he calls all of those things the beginning of the birth pains. And what are the birth pains? The false teachers, the false messiahs, the wars, the rumors of wars, famines, earthquakes. 
Now I ask you, haven't we not experienced all those things? just in the last century alone. In verse 9, Jesus says that they will stand before the councils, like the Sanhedrin, that the disciples will be beaten in the synagogues. They will stand trial before governors and kings. In John chapter 14, through 16, Jesus told them that the Holy Spirit would tell them what to say in those cases. And we see that Jesus says this very same thing in verse 11. And they will bring you to trial and deliver you over. Do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. The book of Acts reminds us of how these things unfold. Before the temple is preached, the gospel must be spread throughout all the world. Now we kind of have this thing that everybody throughout the whole world has to have heard the gospel. And that's how we kind of get this skewed in a way. We know that some of the apostles went to India. We know that some went to Spain. There were those that went into Africa. The word was carried, not to the whole populations, but individuals and people in the, those regions who continued to share that gospel. In Colossians 1 and verse 6, in verse 23, in Romans 16, verse 23, Paul writes that the gospel has been made known to all nations. And then in verse 13 of Mark 13, Jesus tells them to endure through all of those difficulties. That when they do, and when they reach the end, that they will be saved. There are further signs that Jesus gives of what's going to happen when it leads up to the destruction of the temple. But verse 14 gives us the big sign. And you will see the abomination of desolation standing <coughs> where he ought not be. Let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountain. If this is about the end of the world, what good is it going to do to run to the mountains? You're not going to find a cave that's going to keep you safe. <coughs> and why would only the people in Judea run and not everybody in the whole world? Jesus is giving them the information they need so that they will know when the destruction of the temple and Jerusalem is come. They are going to see that abomination that causes desolation. This is a term that was used in Daniel's prophecies in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, chapter 11, verse 23, and chapter 12, verse 11. It speaks in those verses about an enemy or a power that is attacking Jerusalem. And the time frame of those references center on the rise of the Roman Empire. Luke 21, verse 20. Instead of abomination and desolation, he says, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies. When you see the armies coming where they shouldn't be coming from, it's time to go. Don't check out of the hotel. Don't grab your bags. Just go. Don't pack a snack. Go. Or it will be too late. They also said that it is going to be very difficult for women who are pregnant, those who have young children,
And he told them to hope that it doesn't have happen at winter time because it will make things even more difficult. In verse 23, Jesus tells them to be vigilant. In Mark 13, verses 12 through 31, Jesus describes that great event. Verse 24, after that tribulation, we have a tendency, or the religious world has a tendency to read from verse 24 and presume that this is talking about the end of the world. But in those days, after the tribulation, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Should we be seeing here that Jesus is no longer talking about the temple and the destruction of Jerusalem, but the end of the world? You know, this is common if we examine other verses of Scripture. It's common language used to talk about the fall of the nation. Isaiah 13, verses 9 through 13, that says, Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel, with wrath, fierce anger, to make the land a desolation and destroy the sinners from it. For the stars of the heavens and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be dark at its rising, and the moon will not shed its light. I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will put an end to the pomp of the arrogant. I will lay low the pompous pride of the ruthless. I will make the people more rare than fine gold and mankind than the gold of Ophir. Therefore, I will make the heavens tremble. I will make the earth be shaken out of its place at the wrath of the Lord of hosts in the day of his fierce anger. Now that sounds like the end of the world too, doesn't it? But Isaiah is prophesying about the destruction of Babylon. We find the same imagery in Mark 13, Matthew 24, verse 21. In the writings of Josephus, he goes into great detail this destruction of Jerusalem and the temple under Titus. Titus had given the people in Jerusalem ample time to surrender. He did not want to destroy the city. He didn't even want to destroy the temple. But they continued to resist. They continued to fight until all was lost. It was truly by accident that actually the temple was set on fire. Many lost their lives in it. They say that there was so much smoke you could not see the sky. But if we look in Matthew chapter 26, verse 64, and Jesus is standing there before Caiaphas, I think on the outline I had verse 6. I forgot the 4. The other thumb was not working properly on the keyboard. He tells Caiaphas, the high priest, that he would see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven. Now just how would Caiaphas see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven? If it was in reference to the end of the world. In verse 30, Jesus said this generation, and this is the key, will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Are we living in an alternate universe somewhere? Are we reading what happened in a different place, a different time. We're reading what happened then. The beginning of a lesson where the disciples asked when the temple would be destroyed, 
Jesus declares at that point that the day and the hour will not be known. Only God knows when this is going to happen. The point seems to be that God has not determined the actual time that Jerusalem will fall. Most assuredly, this happened after the deaths of Peter and Paul. But there were other disciples, John included, who will live to see this day. What is certain is that these things were going to take place in their lifetime. And so he told his disciples, be vigilant. Stay awake. Stay awake. What we gather from all this, you and I, is to stay awake, to be vigilant, to work each and every day on our own lives, following our Lord and Savior, to the best of our abilities, obeying all that we know we need to obey to the best of our abilities. For Paul was the one that wrote about the second coming of Christ and those things that will happen. And Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 1, and 6, 1 through 6, that the Lord will come as a thief in the night. I don't know how many thieves out there have actually rang the doorbell and said, hey, uh, just leave your doors unlocked. I'm going to be in tonight to get your stuff. It doesn't happen. While people are out there saying there is peace and security, when the sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains and they're not going to escape. How is Jesus going to come? Like a thief in the night. He is going to come at a time where no one's going to expect it. There's one group of people that actually said Jesus is already here walking amongst us. He's just invisible. I'll spare that group's name. So let us not sleep as others sleep. Let us stay awake, be sober, and vigilant. Jesus warned of those in Mark 13 to be vigilant and stay awake. Paul tells us that the same thing applies. We cannot assume that tomorrow is going to get you, that everything will be right with God. We only have this moment, this very minute, to make things right. If you are not a child of God, now is the time. Now is the convenient time. We are here. Make your decision. Become that child of God. Then stay vigilant. Stay awake. When that great day comes, you will find your rewards. If you have not become a child of God, we want to give you that opportunity tonight. And if you are a child of God, if you found yourself slipping away, that you've lost your vigilance, you can make those things right and return. If any has a need, won't you come as together we stand and we sing. The song is 4 7. Art thou weary? Art thou languid? Art thou
seated. The table is prepared for those who do not have the opportunity to go and suffer to come forward this time to your reset. Bow with me as we ask the blessing for the bread. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your son, for all the things that he have done, has done for us in saving our souls, giving us new life, and freeing us from sin. As we partake of this bread, we ask your blessings on it. If we can focus solely on that sacrifice and how he willingly died in our stead. In his name we pray. Continue in prayer, please. Our Father in heaven, we ask your blessings on this fruit of the vine that represents the blood that was shed on that cruel cross. And we're just grateful, Lord, that we had this opportunity to come around this table to celebrate that wonderful sacrifice on the cross, the blood that gives us our freedom, the blood that saves our souls. In your son Jesus' name we pray. the basket on the table for those who did not have the opportunity to give this morning. Bow with me, please. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the abundance in our lives, the blessings that you have given us. And we're just grateful, Lord, that you have seen it fit for us to be caretakers of all these blessings. So we ask now, Lord, that you accept our gifts in return, that these gifts may be used to further thy kingdom here on this earth. And we pray, Lord, so fervently that with all these things, that our mission works, especially those in India, will be able to continue. Remove the obstacles that they face and allow these monies to be able to continue to further thy kingdom in that country <coughs> and around the world. We thank you so much for all you do for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you'll please stand, we'll be dismissed with prayer. We do have our prayer meeting tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. Thank you. Most gracious and kind Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for all the many blessings you have given us to us throughout our lives. We're thankful for the opportunity that we've had to come here tonight to sing songs of praise to Sunday do, to hear a portion of thy word spoken unto us. We pray that we will take the things we have heard here tonight, apply them to our lives, and become stronger Christians and teach others about thy word. We pray that you would be with Paul, that he would get over uh, the COVID, that he would get back to his normal walks of life. We pray that you would be with Deborah, the doctors and the nurses attending to her, that you would do the best things possible for her. We pray that you would be with our shut-ins, that you would watch over them. We pray that you would always watch over us, that you would guide, guard, and direct us throughout our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.